me, Bonnie Burns, and welcome to the Superhero Dog Owner Show. I'm your host, Dom Hodgson. I'm joined, as ever, by the rather brilliant and quite handsome Alex the Video <laughs> Guy. Hello. <laughs> and um, today we're going to be bringing you an interview. I'm going to be talking about that in a minute. Um, an interview with Debbie Jacobs, who's a dog trainer from across the pond. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about my, my weekend, Alex, that I had. Okay, great. So um, we, we went to Blackpool. Oh, weekend. yes, yes, yeah. I read your email about that. The Vegas of the North. Indeed it is. Um, Bright lights, yeah, big city. Yeah, um, it wasn't a, a stag weekend or anything like that. Well, it was a lad's weekend, mm-hmm. but a lad's weekend with a difference because I, I went with my uh, youngest son, Toby, Yeah. and Toby does dancing, singing and dancing and stuff. And uh, he was in a, they were in a semi-final of a competition, the That's Showbiz UK um, talent competition. And it was semi-final, and so we had to go all the way to Blackpool um, for this. The two buses worth of mams and kids all went down. Oh, well, grief. just from this dance school, there was like hundreds, you know, from across mm-hmm. the UK. But um, so we went down. Um, we had a little bit of time in Blackpool on Saturday. Went out, got a picture in front of the tower, uh, spent a few quid in the arcades, and then we had a nice little slap-up meal before we went back and had a drink with everybody else. And, uh, and that was it. We crashed. Then with the Sunday, we were in the sitting in the theatre all day. Watching dance school after dance school after mm-hmm. dance school after dance school, <laughs> performing a range of different uh, dances. Most of them were really good. I did get a little bit tiresome towards the end, <laughs> especially as Toby didn't perform until about ten to six. Oh man! <laughs> um, and then, uh, but anyway, he did it, and he did great. They, they performed really well. His troupe didn't get through, unfortunately, oh. to the final, oh, nice. which was a little bit of a shame. But you know, life's full of disappointments, people. Um, and it's good that they learn this when they're young as well. So, uh, <laughs> so some of the, so some troops went through, some didn't, but we had a great time anyway. And the top and bottom of it is Toby. He loves his dancing. You know, mm-hmm. he really loves it, and um, he goes like three, four times, five times a week sometimes. Um, and he's just he's just absolutely loving his life. You know, he's done a, a range of different things as we all do when we're kids. Football lessons. Uh, he did karate for a while, mm-hmm. and he was really good at that as well. You know, he, he really sort of. It was, it was no Bruce Lee, but he was, he was, you know, I don't know. He seems to take to, uh, like structure and learning mm-hmm. things like yeah, really yeah. well like that. And he was flying through the belts, got up to a brown belt, I think, and, and then one day he just didn't want to go back, mm-hmm. and um, it was it was weird. He just he just really didn't didn't want to go, and uh, he got a little bit upset about it, a little bit you know a little bit emotional, and um, and so we had a chat about it and stuff. And in the end, he just uh, there was nothing particularly bad. I mean, the class was awesome, you know. The teachers were brilliant. The senseis, I should say, mm-hmm. um, they were really good. And but I, I just it just wasn't his bag, you know. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe we had pushed him too much, and just because he was good at it, and I used to push him a bit. Um, so this is maybe three or four years ago now, and so he, he kind of jacked it in, which was disappointing at the time. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. Um, but obviously you want him to be happy, don't you? <laughs> you know. Course, so um, yeah. so he and then he ended up starting doing the the singing and the dancing and stuff, and he's changed skills a couple of times since then. But settled in a place in town, and anyway, absolutely loving it. So what's the point of all this story, Alex? Apart from me just sitting there like this is your life. <laughs> the point of this story is is that if you know if your child or your dog is doing something and you're doing something with your dog and he's not enjoying it you know maybe he's fearful maybe he gets too excited you know maybe it's just the behavior that he that he shows when he's when he's doing this thing is uh is inappropriate you know it's not something that you we want to encourage you know if you were going to the park and your dog's you know, he's getting out of control when he's playing with other dogs and stuff. Or maybe, he's, maybe he might be fearful. You know, he might be mm-hmm. fearful of other dogs. But you, as the owner, you might not be picking up on all the signs. Um, well, th- this interview that we're going to be bringing you now is w- w- will will certainly help with that, because um, Debbie Jacobs is a, a dog trainer from the US of A, like I said, and she is specialises in uh, fearful dogs, right. uh, treating fearful dogs. She's got um, a couple of really cool books out. But anyway, I'm not going to go into the details about it because we did the interview. Um, at home, and this is it right now. So could you press play, Alex? Play. So my guest today is a dog trainer and behaviourist from Vermont. She's currently living in Plymouth, Mass, and she's been helping dog owners for many, many years. She's probably most well known for her work with um, helping dogs who are shy, scared, and, and, and suffering with fear problems. She's the author of A Guide to Living and Working with a Fearful Dog, and I'm delighted to welcome to the show Debbie Jacobs. Hello, Debbie. Hey. 
Thanks very much for giving us your time. We're going to dive. Uh, we're going to dive straight in, Debbie, with the greyhound round. This is a, okay. a quick fire round where uh, where people can get to know a little bit more about you really quickly. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, off we go. <clears throat> um, your favorite superhero? Oh, I don't have a superhero. They're just they they just seem um, they just seem so self obsessed, so <laughs> self absorbed. You know, they're about saving the world and you know, fighting crime, and I just, I, I, I don't have one. Okay, okay, that's a fair enough answer. Um, do you prefer Indian or Chinese food? Who, who's buying and who's cooking? <laughs> I'm buying. I, I'll have whatever you have. <laughs> Would you prefer to walk a pug in the park or a Boston at the beach? I actually prefer a Weimarana in the woods. All right, okay, okay, I like, I see what you did there. Very good, very good. Your favorite uh, doggy film? Oh, there's a film, I remember it years ago. It's the only one that's, that sort of, it made my husband cry at the end. Um, I think it was called The Longest Journey. And it, and it had Michael J. Fox was one of the voices and a golden retriever shadow who you don't think is going to make it, but he makes it. And it's, um, that was the only one I think I could actually sit through without getting angry. <laughs> <laughs> very good very good all right interesting answers debbie interesting I'm, i'll give you i'll give you eight out of ten for those well done well done thank you um so let's dive straight in one of the one of the big things i think pet dog owners think is that um us dog trainers know everything and obviously we don't we make lots of mistakes we always make mistakes we're always learning um so just to let people know that, you know, we don't get it right all the time. Can you tell us a story about, uh, you know, an embarrassing thing that's happened to you while you were training? Um, well, I, I don't know that, I, that it happened while I was training, um, but it did happen with one of my dogs who was clearly not trained. Um, I was taking a canoeing course and um, they had a big roast on the counter that they were going to feed all the students with. And while I'm outside while we're practicing with our canoe paddles and we're learning all that, suddenly my dog goes running by with the roast in his mouth, um, in her mouth, um, <laughs> which I tracked her down, I chased her down, and I got the roast back, and I handed it to the fellow who was running the program, and he just looked at me, you know, with just complete disgust and said, I don't want it now. Uh, so I... Uh, <laughs> I don't remember if I gave it back to her or not, but I just remember being very embarrassed seeing my dog running by with everybody's lunch. Uh, <laughs> Good story. Are, are you all sorted there? Well, I was getting a bit motion sickness with all the walking around. Oh, sorry. I, I think I don't know whether one of my dogs was starting to bark, so I gave her a new food toy. Yeah, so, one of mine started. Can you just hang on two seconds, Debbie? I'll be back in a yep. second. Right, so w the show's essentially for, for pet dog owners, Debbie, who are, I, I want them to to find out a bit more about what they can do with their dogs, you know. Um, but first of all, I, I want to find a bit more about you and, and where your motivation comes from to, for, for working with dogs, you know. So before you were a, a trainer and an author, you know, what was, your, what was it like for Debbie Jacobs growing up with dogs? What was your experience? Well, I grew up, I was born into a family with a dog. And so it was probably, probably some of my earliest social experiences were probably with a dog. You know, when you're a little kid, you you tell all your secrets to the dog. And I remember um, when I was in grade school, which would be up to about age 12, uh, when I would go to take walks alone in the woods or in the cranberry bogs, um, you know, which no kid does nowadays, no parent would, would do nowadays. Uh, but my mother used to say, bring the dog. <laughs> bring the dog. And I had this little fat fox terrier named Samantha. And, I, and as an adult, I remember thinking, what did she think Samantha was going to do for me out there with, <laughs> with, you know, when the evil, you know, boogeyman came for me? Um, but that was pretty much, you know, I just grew up with them. I just enjoyed their company. I like to take walks. I like to hike. Um, and so I always had a, a dog for company. So that was probably... Um, my interest, I, I went into, I, I did some volunteer work, I volunteered with the shelter, I got involved with uh, rescue, primarily rescue um, from dogs from the Caribbean, mm -hmm. from Puerto Rico. They have a tragic, really tragic overpopulation uh, problem there, and I'd bring dogs over. So that was sort of, you know, I was a hobby trainer, I 
take agility classes with my dogs or nose work classes or just kind of played around. So that was really, um, I, I was not interested in being a dog trainer. I mean, I had no interest in, I liked it, but it didn't seem, I, I didn't even realize that it was a, a possibility as an occupation. Um, because when I was growing up, there were no dog trainers there. You were a vet or you were an animal control officer. Oh. I mean, those were your options if you were going to work with animals. And people would say, oh, you, know, you, should be a, you should be a vet. You like dogs so much. Yeah, but I'm allergic to cats and <laughs> you know, I'm not interested in medicine. So, um, so where did it come I, from? Where, where did the, what was the point when you, when you realized that you could become a dog trainer? And, you know? Well, I, I mean, I have to confess that I, I, it, it, I still sometimes am, am, um, I'm a very lazy trainer myself. <laughs> I am yeah. just so lazy. I am. Um, I, I could care. Uh, I, I know my dogs wish I could care more about agility and them doing all these tricks, which I love to watch people train their dogs to do all those tricks and their rats to do tricks. I, I, just, I think it's so great. All those freestyle dances. I look and go, oh, that's so cool. And then I think, eh, I think I'll just go for a walk. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a fairly lazy trainer, but it uh, I, I, it, it probably was about, even though I had already sort of started on the path of dog training, I got my, in the United States, we have a certification called the um, uh, CPDT, which is a certification for professional dog trainers, um, which I actually got after I, I started writing my book. And, um, and, and really, it, it wasn't until about three years, say about three or four years ago when I was introduced to the, to, the, to the concept that behavior is lawful, that, that the training of animals is based on the science of applied behavior analysis. And that's when I suddenly realized, oh, I could do this. Because prior to that, dog training seemed like well, you go take this seminar, and then you go take that seminar, and then there's this technique, and this method, and this protocol, and on and on. And I remember thinking when I would go out with a, a local trainer who used to take me on, um, you know, a mentor, and I remember thinking, how, how could I ever know? How do I, what if I haven't gone to the right seminar? What if uh -huh. I haven't learned the right protocol? What if I didn't read the right, you know, new, you know, new magic method? How would I know how to, what to do? And so I was scared. Huh. I was afraid. I can't. I, what if somebody has a really bad problem with their dog? And I show up and I'm like, oh, gosh, you know, I didn't take that seminar on how to huh. work with food aggression. Or I didn't know how to do, deal with separation. And, oh, jeepers, the dog is doing this or that. But then when I discovered that, that there is actually this science that it's based on, and if I could learn it, huh. if I could learn the science, then I could deal with every, you know, any problem yeah, because we just everything. follow yeah. the science. Mm -hmm. And that to me was like the clouds parted, the sun rays came shining through and it said, you can do this. You can learn this. Um, and then I just started, I really, be I believe in the science. So I use the science and when you use it, you get results. Yeah. And then that for me, it was just fabulous. Mm -hmm. for, for, for a pet dog owner, if you could break it down, the, the science, you know, mm -hmm. yep. really, you know, for, 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 for someone who doesn't, you know, they haven't got a degree in canine psychology or whatever, you know, and they just, they just got their pet dog, break, break, break it down for, for me if you can, re sure. really, really quickly. Sure. I can, um, let me see how many words it is. Dogs <laughs> do what works. Four <laughs> words. Yeah, yeah. Dogs do what works works. Our job, the only thing we have to do is we have to make it clear to them what it is we want them to do and why they should do it. Oh. That's it. Awesome. And why should they do it? Because we have the food. <laughs> and, and food works for every animal that you see trained on the planet by professional modern trainers is trained using food. And food, and do they want the food? Yes. Will they figure out what they need to do to get the food? You 
bet they will. Mm -hmm. And if we can be clear, what do you need to do to get this cheese? You need to put your rear end on the floor. You need to sit and you get chicken or you get cheese. Guess what that dog is going to do more of? They're going to put their behind on the floor. And that is really the, the, the meat the, yeah. to be you know, a bad pun. Or the cheese, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that really is what we do. Yeah. And, yep. that, and, if, and, if, and if the very thing, if we could get pet owners to do one thing, one thing only, and that is stick a bunch of cheese in their pocket, put a treat belt on, and when they see their dog do something that they like, Give them a piece of food. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When, they want, when they ask their dog to do something and the dog actually does it, pay them. Mm -hmm. Nobody does anything for nothing. Not even our beautiful, fabulous dogs. Neither do our significant others, our children, our, our employees, our bosses, our kids, mm -hmm. our spouses. No, Nobody you're dead does right. anything for nothing. Yeah, no, I like that. Use the food. I'm all, I always say use the food. Use the food. You know, it's there. The dogs need it. The dogs like it. So, it so use it. Use it. And it works. Yeah. It um, works. So moving yeah. on, Debbie, moving on to, I mentioned about um, your website's primarily dealing with uh, fearful dogs, you know, the fearful dogs website, which is full of great resources and the, the ebook you can purchase and stuff. Can, can you tell us about how, how that became to be the thing that you, you concentrate on a lot and particularly the story about how Sonny came into your life and, you know, how, where that led you and stuff? Sure. Um, I had been, um, I, I, in 2005, after the hurricanes, we had Katrina and Rita, the big hurricanes mm. that wiped out huge yeah. portions of, of the, you know, flooded uh, the south, so southern part of the United States, around, specifically around the Louisiana, uh, uh, Mississippi area. I went down to volunteer at one of the rescue camps where they'd set them up and they were bringing all of these hundreds and hundreds of animals. And there were lots of, uh, there were a bunch of dogs. I was there. I, they had pulled in, um, they had pulled in a bunch of dogs from a hoarder. This was somebody who was collecting dogs. After the hurricane, she went around collecting dogs, saying that she was a rescue. She wasn't a rescuer. She was a hoarder. She had 477 dogs when they finally figured out that this woman was a hoarder, not a rescuer. And Sonny was one of them. And he was brought from her property to this Camp Katrina where I was. And he, and this gets every single one of us, he looked like a dog I had, <laughs> right? He reminded me of a dog that I had. He's black and white. There's a Border Collie look to him. I had a Border Collie. Oh my gosh, look at this. And he was so shy. And when I went to his pen, he ran and hid. And I said, look, look, send that dog up to me in Vermont and he'll live in paradise and he'll be, you know, he'll have a great life. We'll find a home for him. Well, when they brought, when I got him and I took him out of his cage, he, you know, circled the living room and then landed in a corner and he didn't move for weeks. He was terrified. And I realized at that point, that everything that I thought I knew about dog training was not adequate. It was not good enough. I had a lot of rubbish in my head about what to do. I did, I did things wrong. I, ha I got lots of well-meaning but not great advice. There's miserable information online. Uh, and that's when I realized uh, that we really... I needed to add my voice to the, the, the collection of uh, the voices in the choir mm. that were actually using good information to, to work with these dogs because there's so much rubbish. Out. I mean, it's changed now mm. in 10 years. There's, now you do a search and you can find not just my website, but lots of good information. Mm. The Many of the professional organizations, the vets and the vet behaviorist organizations, they have also started adding to the choir. And that wasn't going on 10 years ago. So that was really it. I, I found some people who helped me, who mentored me. Uh, again, I started, you know, poco a poco, I started learning. And mm. that was really the, um, 
that was it. That, that was, was it. That was it. Yeah. You know, became the catalyst. Yeah. In, yeah. Really interesting. So, h helping you know people who have fearful dogs. Obviously, it's going to require a lot, a lot of patience, and I would generally recommend pet dog owners that they that they, if they can, they should seek the help of you know a, a qualified behaviorist or trainer because. There's so much you can do to make things worse, isn't there? Un unintentionally, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. But the owner's obviously very important. They've got a, a huge role to play because they, they're with the dog every day. Um, what, what, advi what advice would you give to dog owners who, who have a dog who is fearful or nervous, you know? And what's the best things that they can do to... Uh... Yep, sure. Let me, just move, let me just move this girl. She's insisting on barking at something in the other room. Go ahead. Go bark. Go bark away from me. Um, well, first of all, I would, I would highly recommend, like you say, find a trainer, but you make sure that that trainer is clear, that, that, they, that they are very clear about not ever doing anything that scares or hurts the dog, number one. Hmm. If they do anything, any, and don't, any excuse, any reason they make for intimidating, using force, Anything that makes your dog duck their head, cower away, behave aggressively, look scared, um, or actually physically hurts them, walk away. Because the damage that we can do to a dog may be irreversible. Mm. That's really important. That it's very easy to instill fear in a dog or install fear mm -hmm. in a dog. And it may be in some cases, and this is not to be depressing, but it may be impossible in some cases to ever get rid of it. So we have to be very, this is why we tread very carefully. Yeah. And there's no downside to treading carefully because for the dogs who have a little bit more resist, resilience, or dogs who are a little bit more flexible or adaptable, they're going to benefit as well. So, mm. so we don't, yeah. you know, even those that have a little bit more, everyone, call, everyone benefits from, from taking it slow. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And if you, um, so if you have a, that's great advice about the, the trainer and, and seeking a trainer. I guess in a similar way, you, you, they could take that advice on, on, on the, the, what they do with the dog. You know, if they're taking the dog places where they think the dog is, is afraid or, or he doesn't like, you know, they, they'd be best off avoiding those kind of places as well, wouldn't they, you know? Yes, because the, the next thing we want to do, Dominic, this is a great question and it's one that, we, that I've sort of... Um, the general format for it is, number one, keep the dog feeling safe, mm -hmm. however that is for that dog. Mm -hmm. You know, we can just say generally, does the dog feel safe? The first thing we have to do is stop scaring them. Mm -hmm. This is not the last step, and the goal isn't to keep them wrapped in cotton wool, you know, hidden in a room somewhere. That's not the goal, but we have to stop scaring them. They have to feel safe, whatever that means for that dog, number one. Number two is we change the association they have with things. Hmm. So if they're afraid of little children, if little children scare them, we change what little children predict for them. Hmm. So when little children are around, the dog gets chicken. Hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, that's great. When they go for walks, they get cheese on the walks. When the scary man with a hat and a beard comes in the house, the dog gets a bone and gets to go eat it in the other room. We change what the scary things predict for the dog. That's number two. The th number three is we give them skills. We train them using primarily high rates of positive reinforcement. We teach them, what do I want you to do when you see a toddler? Well, I want you, all I want you to do is sit down hmm. and eat cheese. Give the dog information. Teach them what, they want, what you want them to do. What do I want you to do when we go for walks outside? I just want you to walk nicely next to me. Hmm. Hmm. You know, and if I need to feed you a lot of chicken and happy talk and, you know, get you along and then that's it. So we hmm. give them skills. You know, what we would never give a firefighter a brand new piece of equipment, send them into a burning building, and say, good luck, <laughs> go learn how to use your new, your new air tank. We mm -hmm. would never do it. We do that to dogs all the time. We put them in situations, they don't have the skills, and then we say, look, he's, you know, he's behaving 
inappropriately. He's yeah, growling, yeah. he's aggressive. But he just he didn't know. He didn't have enough information. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic, Debbie. I think I think that I think that alone what you said there will, will be enough for if people listen and they take that advice on board, you know, and try and avoid and try and think about how they can make that scary association not so scary anymore, then you know, they'll go a long way to making their dogs' lives a lot happier and their own lives too. Te- we're coming to the end of the interview now, Debbie. Can you tell me what is the best bit of advice you've ever been given in your life? This can be dog-related or anything else. Well, I would say, you know, when, when I was growing up and I would be moving somewhere or getting a new job or, you know, whatever it was, my mother would always say to me, as long as you're happy. <laughs> as long as you're happy. And so I think that I've taken that and when I'm working with my dogs or anybody's dog, I always think, as long as they're happy. <laughs> as long, if I can make you happy, I can get you to do practically anything. So oh, that's oh. it. As long, you know, we work for the wag. I like that. Yeah, very good. Very good. And I was going to say, can you tell me a story about how you've used that in your, in, in your business, in your personal life or your business life? But you kind of explained that there as well. You know, that's brilliant. Where can people go to find out more about you and, and what you're up to, Debbie? Um, there's the fearfuldogs.com website. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, I've got a fearfuldogs.com page on Facebook that mm-hmm. just is a bunch of things that I think are interesting. Yep. Um, and then there's also the fearful dog group on Facebook where we have people, we have trainers, we have vets, we have vet behaviorists, and, um, we talk about, our dogs, we help people, we try to provide support to people, and we stick with the science. We hmm. stick with evidence-based information. We're not throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks because we don't have time. These dogs, they yeah. never live long enough. However long they live, it's never long enough. We want to get, we, we want to, we don't want them to, to spend any longer being afraid uh, than they already have. Yeah, I agree. I agree. When, 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 you're not, uh, when you're not, you know, posting in the Facebook group or, 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 or helping about dogs or walking your own dogs, how does Debbie Jacobs like to chill out and relax? Um, well, that's, I think that's probably it. You know, I love <laughs> what I do so much that when I have the choice, I'm, I'm talking about dogs, I'm thinking about <laughs> dogs, I'm, or reading about behavior. Um, I'm, I'm basically pretty lazy, although I did just finish painting our deck. So oh, you know, I, I do yeah. get some work done. Very productive, now. very productive. <laughs> well, thanks very much for your time, Debbie. I really, really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone who's watching is going to really enjoy uh, listening to what you've got to say. And uh, I want to thank you much again for your time. So take care of yourself, Debbie. Uh, thank you so much for having me. No problem. Bye now. Bye. So, Alex, the video guy. How brilliant was that? <laughs> it was. It was awesome. <laughs> brilliant. And brilliant. Awesome and brilliant and cool. Now, she was really she really good uh, really good to talk to. I did think at one point when she kind of wandered off that she, well, I was worried that she wasn't going to come back. <laughs> but uh, but she did come back and she did finish and she shared a lot of wisdom with us as well. And, uh, you know, having a, a dog who's extremely fearful can be really upsetting as a dog owner. Um, I've been fortunate enough not to own a dog who has been particularly fearful. Or Barry was afraid of the wind and... Uh, mm-hmm fireworks and things but not overly so you know so um and, and so if you do have a problem like that it's well worth you you're trying to contact a, a behaviorist or someone you know really experienced who can help you to um help you to just manage the situation better that's the main thing you know a lot a lot of these severe dog problems you might never fix completely you know and mm-hmm. that, people don't want to hear that sometimes but it's true you know and you have to you have to just work with what you've got and but there's no reason why if you if you don't go and see a, a behaviorist or a trainer um, someone who can help you, then you can certainly improve the situation so you can manage it a lot better and, you know, have a more enjoyable life with your dog, you know, even sure. though it, it might never be that, you know, that there never is a perfect anyway. Well, I, <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking, yeah, yeah nothing's, no, nothing and nobody, no dog is perfect. Yeah, either, for so. sure, for sure. So, um, but you can certainly make your life a lot better by, by managing the situation a lot better. Sure. And you should see a trainer as well. If you have a dog who just don't listen to you, maybe he's a bit of a minx, Maybe is he more interested in birds, squirrels, other dogs farting, things like that, whatever. Maybe is he just more interested in other things than he is in you. Then there's something that you can do as a pet dog owner, and that is to buy my book. This is my best-selling dog training book, How to Be Your Dog Superhero. That's me and Barry. I'll send you a signed copy of the book, and you'll also get a bookmark. 
And you might even get a Barry bar if you're Ooh, especially lucky. Tasty. Uh, yeah, organic chocolate. Fair <laughs> trade, I think it is anyway. For humans, um, not dogs. Yeah, so buy the chocolate bar and you get a free book. Yeah, that's how, that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want a book, a copy of my book, you should go to www.mydogsuperhero.com and you can get it there. Or it's available as an audio book on Audible. Uh, you can purchase it that way and it's also available on Kindle too. So, But you only get the chocolate bar and a little note from me and the bookmark if you buy the paperback book from, from the address that I just gave you. So, if you haven't done that, that's what you need to do. Next week, Alex, to wrap up, well, next week we're going to be talking to um, another dog trainer. Um, this one is a... Um, this follows on quite nicely, actually, from, from this week because... Um, Emma Lee, who we're talking to, she runs a dog rescue um, in France. Oh, awesome. And yeah, I was a big fan of her blog and I contacted her and we, we got the interview set up. Um, so, so we're going to be talking to her because obviously when people get rescue dogs, some of those are fearful as well. You know, you yeah. can they can come with problems and things. And yeah, we've got a really interesting conversation coming up next week with Emma Lee. So um, we'll catch you then. Thank you to Alex, the video guy. No problem. And if we don't see you through the week, we'll see you through the window. Mm-hmm.